Hello, hi everyone and welcome to High Up session number two. My name is Dom and as well as being a High Up disability support worker, I'm also part of High Up's learning and development team. Uh, and tonight I'm so excited to be joined by our wonderful panel. We've got Nicole, Elisa, we've got Chairman, we've got Ramona. I'm gonna get these guys to introduce themselves very soon and they're gonna be providing their wonderful insights into the topic of autism. Um, I'm also so excited as when we put this out to our community, we didn't know how it would get picked up. We didn't know how it would get received. And we've had over 500 people register to take part in this live discussion. So thank you so much. And for all those who registered, thank you to all of you who have submitted a question. We had over 150 questions submitted, which is amazing. So thank you. Um, that's really crafted the, the content that we're gonna be covering tonight. And it's also been the questions that I'm gonna be asking our wonderful panel. Um, and to those who are joining us on Facebook Live, hello, welcome, it's good to have you here as well. Uh, feel free to give us a like, feel free to give us a share. The more involved in this conversation, the better. We really want to have this conversation on scale. Um, and before I get the panel to introduce themselves, because I know they're probably getting sick of me speaking already, I just wanted to give uh, a quick rundown of some quick housekeeping. So tonight we have scheduled around 30 minutes for this discussion, but Given that we've got such amazing people, we might go a little bit over time. So if we get to the 30 minute mark, you need to go cook dinner, you need to go pick up the kids from somewhere, that's all good, don't stress, we'll be sending you a live recording uh, in, the, in the coming weeks. That recording will be captioned, and when you get it, you can share it with your friends and family as well. Um, and, and just quickly, quickly, just finally, shedding some light on the topics that we'll be covering tonight. Uh, more broadly, uh, our wonderful panel will be giving their insights into autism, that's gonna take up the vast majority of, of, of the higher up session, but we will be touching on uh, related behaviours, uh, more specifically talking about uh, applied behaviour analysis and it's great to have Ramona, a clinical psychologist, to help discuss that and shedding a little bit of light on positive behaviour support. Uh, and just wrapping up this little introduction, uh, we understand that we are talking about autism and behaviour tonight. I just want to acknowledge that those two, uh, those two topics don't necessarily go hand in hand, but given the fact that our community has been so uh, passionate about getting more insights into autism and more insights into, into behavior, we really want to use this as a platform to kickstart the discussion. And that's what this is, it's a kickstart. We will be having more of these conversations. So anyway, um, getting the panel to introduce ourselves, I might start with you, Chem, if that's okay. Um, do you reckon you could tell me just really quickly a little bit about yourself and why you wanted to, why you wanted to join us here tonight to take part in this high-up session discussing autism? Um, so my name is Chem, which is short for Chilamios Mexico. Uh, um, I'm an office clerk at Jigsaw. I've been working there for uh, four years now. Um, uh, I like, I like to play uh, video games in my spare time and also go on Facebook and watch YouTube. And also, I'm also a little bit of a digital artist on the side as well. Awesome. Uh, my nationality is Thai and um, yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Tim. It's so good to have you here tonight. So thanks for coming along. Uh, Ramona. So, yep, yeah, Ramona. I'm a clinical psychologist from Diverse Minds Clinic in Sydney. Um, I'm so. You know, I work in private practice at the moment, but I've also done some research in sort of the field of autism and anxiety. Um, very excited to be here tonight, uh, hoping to help share some information um, based on the clinical work that I do. Uh, yeah, that's about it. Thank you. Thanks for the introduction. Elisa? Hi, I'm Elisa, and uh, I'm a mum of three amazing kids, one of whom lives his life on the autism spectrum. Um, and I'm also the founder and CEO of Plan Tracker. Awesome. Uh, but tonight, I'm really keen just to share as a parent, I guess, some of my experiences, um, having done some hard yards now 14 years, um, and hopefully just share some ideas that, that might just spark something that, that might work for you. Thank you. And Nicole? Hello, I'm Nicole Rogerson. Um, I think I wear a few different hats. I'm the CEO of Autism Awareness Australia, but I'm also the mum of a 22-year-old with autism. Um, he's not mine because that ages me, so I'm just, I'm just I'm lying about his age. Um, but I've also spent um, 16 years actually working in autism service provision. So I think I have a few different hats on when I, it comes to talking about autism. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. And on behalf of the whole Hire Up community, we're so grateful for you giving up your time to take part in this really incredible uh, and important conversation. Um, I might kick start the, the conversation into talking about what we're going to hear about tonight, which is getting your insights into autism. Um, when I was kind of doing as much reading as I could to kind of prepare myself for tonight, I came across this really wonderful uh, Stephen Shaw quote, and I've seen it on your website before. It's, it goes a little something like, if you've met one person with autism, you've met one person with autism. And I love that quote because it emphasizes how individual autism is. 
I might ask you a quick question first, Ramona. Um, reflecting on this this quote, and you know, given the work you're doing with so many different individuals on the autism spectrum, could you give us a bit of insight into what this spectrum looks like and um, why it's so profoundly different for each and every individual that you do work with? Yeah. So when we're looking at autism, it's a neurodevelopmental condition that we're working with, and it's a very wide spectrum. So you've got the people that might have quite a strong sort of cognitive profile, so they're quite you know, bright and they're able to, um, maybe we're talking about children, they might be in the mainstream school setting doing quite well. Some of them are actually very intelligent and you know, quite smart, um, but then they're struggling on the sort of social side of things. Um, they might have some challenging behavior that sort of stops them maybe making friends and having relationships with other people. Uh, all the way through to um, different individuals maybe that require a lot more support um, and they might need you know, adult intervention to help them through life. Mm -hmm. Some of them might not be verbal, they might need different ways of communication um, to sort of communicate with other people uh, and they might, you know, it's very different. So we're looking yeah. at people that can function on a day-to-day level and other ones that need significant levels of support. Yeah. Um, the whys are still something that research we're kind of working on and yeah. why that diversity, but it is sort of, it's, you know, different presentations that mm. we work with every day. Yeah, so it's incredibly, you know, diverse spectrum. And as a clinical psychologist, every person that you work with must take, you know, with a, a blank canvas, it's completely new. You've learned stuff in the past, but it's really taking every new person you work with a, with a, with a blank, blank canvas and trying to, you know, figure out what's best for that specific individual. Absolutely. And okay. for those that can give us feedback, we want to work with the individual, like what works for you. Um, and then come up with a plan that's going to be the most effective one for that person. Awesome. Well, thank you for that. Um, Chem, I might, I might go to you now if that's okay. Um, as someone who's living with autism, what would you like people to better understand about yourself and specifically about autism? Um, well, for starters, uh, I feel like uh, people with autism aren't that different from a normal person. I've once heard before that uh, like everyone's got a little bit of autism in them. In some way, um, for me, living with autism is like um, it can be challenging sometimes, but it's not that different from someone else who has their own challenges mm. to live with. Mm. Uh, well, does that answer your question? It does. It's an amazing answer. So thank you so much. I love the, the, the quote you gave as well. Everyone's got a little bit of autism in them. Um, Elisa, as a parent managing an account for your son, do you want to give that parent perspective of what it's like raising a child living on the autism spectrum? Yeah, and, and I think it's important that, you know, it's so different for everybody. So I can, I can only speak about my own experience. But um, for us, it, it took a while to work out that um, that my son had autism or has autism. Um, we were, he was six and a half and we moved back from London to Australia. He'd mm. never lived in Australia before, but even though he has Aussie parents. Mm. Um, and life kind of took a very tricky turn and it took us a good couple of years of just, you know, everything going haywire, him falling out of school, um, just not, gel, you know, just life not gelling at all mm. before we kind of realised. Um, since then, I'd have to say, definitely hasn't been smooth sailing. Um, it's, it's had lots of, lots of ups and downs. Um, every day has its challenges. Mm. Um, you know, he's amazing. He can solve a Rubik's Cube in, um, I think his, his personal, his PB is like 14.9 or something. Mm. <laughs> Incredible. But um, yeah, just, you know, living with autism, uh, anxiety plays a big, big role in our household and mm. trying to set up systems and things that, help to reduce anxiety and help communication. Yeah, it's pretty tough. Right. And for you, what are some of those systems, just briefly? I know it's probably a lot, but just... Oh, yeah, it's a big one, big one for sure. So um, we had a really interesting situation happen for us. Um, you know, my son's uh, got an incredible memory and, mm. um, and a very high IQ, but he really doesn't do people. He's, he's really not a fan. And um, anyway, we had a, a quite a significant incident um, April last year, and one of those um, Minecraft meltdown moments, and uh, which I'm sure you know lots of families have had. Um, but for him, it was the end of Minecraft. That was it. Whatever happened, and he also at that time decided to to stop speaking. Um, so he hasn't spoken since. So it's really forced us to actually come up with other creative ways to uh, to be able to communicate and engage. Mm -hmm. um, and some of those are simple things. Well, simple, but you know, um, like 
he learned how to use Auslan. So we all had to learn to use Auslan, which was, you know, not a skill I was hoping to ever need. Mm. Um, <laughs> it's quite a, quite a lot to learn. Um, and he also um, uses speech to uh, text to speech. So using an iPad and speaking with an iPad. So some days, you know, you'll have your conversations in Yoda and other days, like when the Royal wedding was on, we had the queen piping in from the corner. So, um, you know, mm. uh, things like the other, the other thing we do, which is because we're a bit of a techie family, mm. um, we use um, like a messaging service. So even if we're all at home, because it's easier for him to write and, and text digitally, we'll have conversations that are just done by text. So that seems to work quite yeah. well as well. Yeah. Whatever works for you guys, I guess that's, that's the way you want to go. And, and we'll get a bit more into that in, in the next question as well. Um, Nicole, I might go to you. Um, you founded Autism Awareness Australia, was it about 10 years ago? It was a little over 10 years ago, yeah. Um, what would you say in regards to how we perceive or how we kind of talk about autism? What has changed in that 10 years? Um, have we gotten better? Have we gotten worse? What was your kind of personal insights? Oh, I'm going to say, I'm going to give us a sideways pass. Um, some things are remarkably better. Yeah. Um, certainly even going back longer than 10 years when my son was diagnosed in 1999. Um, just imagine your child being diagnosed in a world before the internet. You know, your ability to be able to find information, it's, it's so radically different now. So I want to say that's so much better, but the problem is now there's so much more information for you to have to decipher mm -hmm. to work out what the best opportunities are for you and your child. So... Um, some better, some worse. I think somewhere in the mix, um, the point that you were making initially that's really important is there's no real autism. There's going to turn out to be autisms. Um, I, I find the problem at the moment is that we're trying to have a national dialogue about autism as if we're describing one thing mm. and we're not. We're mm. describing a range of things that manifest themselves very differently in individuals, very differently in families. There is so much going on. Um, it's hard to just have a hard and fast rule about autism. I mean, honestly, if we were really going to talk about autism, this would not be a half an hour webinar, you <laughs> yeah. know, sit tight, everybody pour a glass of yeah. wine and let's really get to the bottom of it. You know, it's, it's not simple. So I, I think we're, it's great that we're talking about it a lot more than we were 20 years ago, but are we talking about it better and more sensibly? I don't know the internet's necessarily giving us many mediums that mean we're doing that. So goods and bads. Cool. Thanks for that. Um, in terms of, yeah, this conversation obviously is not going to go for, you know, over too much over 30 minutes, but we do want to keep the conversation going. And, and we understand that this is just the start of that conversation, as I mentioned earlier. So if you do feel like we've missed anything and you would like to kind of provide any feedback whatsoever, please don't hesitate to, to contact us on Facebook or, or email Hire. We'd love to learn from, from your insights. So don't be shy in reaching out to us. Um, Chem, I might, if I can ask you another question. Um, when we chatted last week, um, you know, you, you mentioned that at times autism can be misunderstood. And I'd just like to know what advice would you give to someone who, who doesn't have autism so they could better understand yourself and, and autism in general? Um, my advice would be that uh, someone with autism, like, doesn't need to be... Um, what did I write down? Sorry, right, take your time. But I'm kind of nervous. I think we all are. <laughs> Okay, my advice would be just because someone has autism doesn't mean they need to be treated differently. Like, um, like what's I think what society can do to help be more inclusive and supportive is to be a bit more aware and understanding of our of uh, of us and like um, like why we do things, our certain behaviors. Mm. Um, like that way, um, they can. Like, uh, like, like, uh, better, better understand us. Brilliant. Yeah. Said, said beautifully. Thank you so much, Chem. Um, I guess in terms of um, support relationships, I think that's a really big one. And, and not, not everyone who's living with autism engages with a support worker. Um, as we know, it's incredibly individual and finding a great support worker is something that you've done really well. Um, Elisa, Elisa, sorry, could you please share um, a success story that you and your son have had with, with finding a support relationship that, that's worked for you? Yeah, well, actually, it's interesting because it's a couple of years ago now and we really hadn't kind of had a support worker or, or been able, you know, we'd had a little bit of respite care mm. delivered by people we didn't really know and it wasn't, wasn't a great scenario. 
And then it was hearing about the NDIS that actually changed everything for me. I, I walked out of an information session thinking, oh, hang on, I've got some great ideas now. And this could really be life changing, um, both, you know, for our whole family. And so um, out of that, I went and looked around in my world and I found um, a younger person who was ready, who was, I thought, oh, I think my son will connect really well here. And at the time we were struggling to get out the front door and, you know, we just even using the backyard was, was an effort for, for us. And so anyway, so I brought this person in and just, um, his name's Matt and he just did, it was amazing. They started with um, Xbox and, you know, before you knew it, a few months later, they're outside bottle flipping. Hmm. I mean, those bottles flipped for so long. So glad that is over. But now, on a Saturday, um, you know, Matt comes over in the morning. They go out and they catch a bus. They go to the next suburb. He, my son does a music lesson. They go and eat a bacon and egg burger, get back on the bus and come back home. And I just think that, you know, that's amazing. Right. So it's been it's been really good. And what role does um, you know obviously you you and your son you know manage your support relationships together? How how do you go about finding a new support worker? Yeah, so I think building your team is yeah. really important. Um, so for us, we do two things because um, we try to have a variety of people who are around our life that mm. they all kind of fulfil a different role. And sometimes mm. people just aren't available. You know, you just you just physically need someone and. That's what you've got to do. So I look around our world and find people I think will be a good match. Mm -hmm. um, might be an, I've found an older couple that um, have been really good at just coming in sometimes when we need a longer amount of, um, of help. Um, and I've, I've brought them to hire up because, you know, they were people I knew and I needed an easy way to be able to engage with them. Mm -hmm. So that worked. Um, and that's what I do with Matt as well. I, I brought him in. But sometimes we'll go into higher up and we'll look around and say, oh, I think that person, like we found a great OT student on higher up. Um, we found some other, we found a person who knows Auslan in our local area. So that's been really helpful so as good. well recently. So we, we kind of do this thing where we find a person on higher up and then we say, hey, we'd love to just get to know you. Can you just pop in for a visit after school? And um, Xander and I do an interview um he comes with his star wars trivia cards um, we do give the person a bit of prep that yeah, there might yeah. be some tricky questions yeah. <laughs> and uh he picks two or three of the best and you know we just check out if they're going to to gel with us or not awesome um yeah so that's kind of our approach i love it it's great <laughs> <laughs> it's good i love the star wars reference as well um nicole i mean as someone you you know one of the most passionate voices that we have in australia on this topic if you could kind of summarize what and obviously understanding autism is such a broad topic, it's more getting your insights, but what would you like uh, people to better understand about autism, if you could summarise quickly? Oh, that's so hard for me to do that. <laughs> I, I, I'll kind of try to reframe it a different way that might help me answer If you want to sideways it, <laughs> no, that's totally no, no. fine. It's just, there's a couple of different things. It, so obviously I know and live with autism and have done since uh, my son was born, so I have that experience with it. But... Then I had 16 years working in a service provider. So I have, and, and then again, another 10 with autism awareness. So I have this very unusual um, situation of having known literally hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of individuals with autism in their family. I'm in a really unique situation like that. So I don't look at autism through any singular lens. I can see all the lenses. I really can. I understand that I see autism from my perspective, mm. but I feel equally as passionate about everybody at all parts of the spectrum and where you're at. And they're all really different places that they're at and they need different things from support workers, um, from, from the needs of a very small child with autism to the needs of, of teenagers and adults. It changes all the way along the line. So if you're working in autism, mm. um, you might arrive to one interview and, and meet one person with autism and to get to your initial point, you'll go to the second interview and like, wow, yeah. that is so different yeah. than, than what I have to do. So yeah. I think the greatest thing is to keep an open mind, understand that autism is not what this person's about. They're an individual in front of you. Autism might explain a couple of the things that are going on, yeah. but it's still a person in front of you and, you and it's still a family that support that person. So looking at it through those individual framework is, is absolutely the number one thing to do. You nailed it. You did so well. Perfect. <laughs> okay. um, on the topic of supports, as someone who's providing clinical support, Ramona, um, at what point does a family or an individual normally come to you and, and seek that support um, as a psychologist? 
another tough question. <laughs> <laughs> it depends. It really depends. So we've got the kids that are coming in. They might be referred from daycare. So the daycare teacher might have picked up some traits or um, behaviours that she thinks you know might as well might might be helpful to get mm -hmm. some insights there all the way through to an adult who's struggling in their relationship and you know they might be encouraged by the partner to come and see us we get a lot of also children that get referred but then we end up working with the parents because it might have been an autism diagnosis that was missed maybe mm -hmm. earlier when they were younger mm -hmm. so it's really it really varies really really varies and what age groups are you typically working with so i'm assuming that varies as well yes, but yeah but it's, it's really all the way through so yeah, we've got cool. at the moment working with an 18 month old and i saw an 81 year old lady this week as well wow so yeah it's a very broad range it is a broad range well thank you for sharing that and sorry for another tough question but i guess that's what it's all about tonight uh, we're trying to give as much insight to our community as possible um I might just segue now onto that topic of behaviour. Um, and I mentioned earlier, although uh, we are talking about autism and behaviour, that doesn't necessarily those, those two go together or go hand in hand. Um, but given the, the questions we've had from our community, we felt like it was really important to acknowledge uh, the questions they've had and raise a few of them here tonight. Um, and Nicole, I might throw to you quickly for this first question. Um, yeah, as I mentioned, someone who's so passionately involved in working with so many thousands of individuals and families, what would you say are some of the common misconceptions around behaviour that, that you hear about? Or you know, what would you like people to, to better understand about behaviour? It's a really good question. And behaviour is the, the topic I'm, I'm most happy to talk about and because I think it's the biggest game-changing yeah. one. And I think to begin with, before discussing behaviour as such, it's really important to realise that, again, looking at people across the spectrum, some people are going to have different behavioural needs than others. Also, when looking at people on the spectrum, you have to decide what behaviour is important and needs changing and what is just part of who that person is. Yeah. I have an embarrassing habit of biting my nails for many years. It's disgusting and an inappropriate behaviour. Uh, so I've learned not to do it in a restaurant. Not quietly to Good on you. House, well done. Right? So I've decided what behaviour is deeply inappropriate and what we can live with. Yeah. The same way is I think we have to decide with the individuals in front of us. But in saying that, and while that was a motherhood statement that just said it depends, um, I do think we have to be realistic. I, I hear Chem's point and working towards an inclusive Australia that understands and respects people with disability and, and neurodiversity is unbelievably critically important. Mm -hmm. It has to be the work that we do. But, the big but here, that's not what society is right now. Yep. So I can't walk into the Commonwealth Bank and... Uh, it, engage in inappropriate, socially inappropriate behaviour in order to get a loan for a million dollars. Or I could, I think it's just fair to say, I'm probably not gonna get it. So there are certain social norms, and not the, not the, import, the unimportant ones, I don't care about eye contact, I don't care about all the little things that you do to make yourself feel comfortable. I care about the big ticket items that are gonna make our kids safe. And are going to make it possible for them to be included in the local school, included in the local community. And if that is something that's controversial, fine, let's have that controversial discussion. Because I get to live with this great adult now who works as a chef in a commercial kitchen, the loudest, most crazy place mm -hmm. in Australia mm -hmm. that you should work, because he learned all of the things that mean that now he's an independent adult mm -hmm. who earns his own money who doesn't need a support worker, who doesn't need his parents for anything. Mm. And it's okay to want that for our kids, to be as independent as possible in their lives, to no longer need their boring parents. So I'm really passionate about appropriate behaviours. And this mm. is not about moulding robot children. It's about giving our kids the skills so they can live successfully in the community. Awesome. Thank you so much for that insight. That was absolutely, you absolutely nailed it. Um, I a bit and I, no, you're not. And I'm sure you could speak for a lot longer. I might get that parent's perspective. Now, you did mention for Elisa that you have worked with behaviour and, and you had some challenging behaviours with your son. Um, there is this, you know, school of thought that behaviour is a form of communication. I think we kind of all can agree with that. Do you want to kind of talk about what that's like for your family? Yeah, it, it definitely is for us. Um, anxiety probably is anxiety and mis misunderstandings yeah. are probably our biggest issue that that will cause behavior um, so for example you know if um, the other day we would we were due to head to Nana's house at four o'clock and of course in the morning I was you know just being a bit lazy and I, I hadn't written the run sheet on the board and written it down and so of course you know 330 comes I think we're all on the same page we've all talked about that we're going to Nana's house I'm not going to Nana's house. You didn't tell me. 
it's not on the plan. You know, I'm like, oh, hang on. And then you've got this moment where it can go very pear-shaped very quickly. So for me, reducing those anxieties by, you know, we've got a great big whiteboard on the, the wall of our kitchen. Yes. Um, and it's like, okay, today, breakfast, <laughs> you know, at 3.30, get ready for Nana's house. 4 p.m., get in the car to Nana's house. And then we're fine, you know. But if it's not on the run sheet, um, I, I did make a bit of an error the other day, though, because I left the run sheet and we had a, did have a support worker in it. And I said, possible snack ideas. But I didn't put an or between them. So, yeah, no, he went through the whole list. <laughs> it's NAND if it's not an or. <laughs> it was NAND kind of night. Yeah. So, yeah, communication. Yeah. Learning from experience, yeah. Yeah, communication for us really helps reduce um, the behaviours that, that we can see. Brilliant. Um, Ramona, I'd love to reflect on that statement a little bit more. Behaviour is a form of communication. Could you provide some of your insights on that as well? Sure. So the first thing I think we need to clarify is that we all engage in behaviour all the time, every day. Yep. So if we're you know, looking at something, if I'm talking, if I'm sleeping, they're all behaviours that we engage in. Um, I guess what we're talking about here is maybe behaviour that makes things a little bit challenging, whether it's for the person or on the spectrum or whether it's their family. Um, it is definitely though a form of communication. Um, so if I've got someone who's highly anxious and they're having a meltdown or highly anxious and they're getting, you know, maybe more withdrawn, it is an, an expression of uh, I'm feeling distressed here. I'm not coping very well mm. and I might not be able to articulate it very well. I might not even be able to understand that that's how I'm feeling, but it is a way of expressing that. When we're seeing the younger children, whether it is autism or not, we're having tantrums, it's yeah. trying to tell your mum something, I'm trying yeah. to tell dad something. Yeah. Um, then on the opposite side of that, when you've got the adults, it might be someone that might need a day in my room by myself because I've just had too much and I'm not coping with this and I can't tell you how I'm, how I'm feeling right now. So it's trying to send a message and I think it's all of our jobs to actually try and understand some of that. Yeah, it's all our responsibility. And we all engage in behaviour every single day, yeah. as you mentioned. Um, you also are trained in applied behaviour analysis. Would you be able to give us a quick summary of what, what that looks like for you? Sure. So AB, Applied Behaviour Analysis, ABA, um, it's, it's a way of teaching, but also a way of shaping behaviour to make it socially, to, to sort of fulfil the social appropriate need that Nicole was just talking about. So there's part of it where we're looking at the skill building. So we're breaking down skills into very small pieces, teach those individual skills, bring them all the way back up um, to complete something a little bit broader. And then we're also managing the difficult behaviour that the individual might be engaging in. So if I've got a child who potentially might be, um, you know, pushing his friends in the playground, it might be that this child doesn't have the appropriate social skills to actually engage in a conversation. Mm -hmm. So I need to focus on managing the skill building side of things, so providing those appropriate social skills, focusing on the language and the communication, but by the same token, making sure that that child actually understands that maybe this is the kind of behavior that's going to get us more friends. Um, and of course, if we're talking children, the family is, you know, you need the family as part of that bigger mm. plan. The teachers, I think, that's another big area that we could be talking here you know, mm. all night, but they need support, they need the resources, the, the training, I think, there's a lot of catching up that I think we still need to do. Absolutely. And how many how many people do you typically engage with when you are, you know, doing applied behaviour analysis? Is it, is it the, the parents? The, the more the merrier, yeah. yeah. So parents, teachers, mums, dads, you know, people that want siblings. To, yeah. Yeah. yeah, if we can. Okay, more. Cool. And I think that we need to be on the same page. Yeah. So if I'm working with a challenging behaviour, I need to make sure that everybody understands what is the behaviour that we're actually working with, yeah. plan to be written up and for everybody to actually follow the plan because that's going to bring down the anxiety then if the, if the child knows or if the adult knows what we're expecting um, and we're all kind of supporting in the same way, then there's the consistent approach that's going to be useful. Awesome. Well, thank you for that really great summary. We also talked about positive behaviour support in the introduction. You, you're you quite passionate about behaviour. Do you have any <coughs> insights on positive behaviour support and how that's used in support relationships? I think it's positive behaviour support is fantastic. And I think the fact that people talk about it now, like it's a, it's a common thing in the autism field is just wonderful. Yeah. Um, it certainly didn't belong to the field of ABA and for people who aren't interested in ABA, um, there are great things that you can learn out of positive behaviour support. I think, just think of anything that you do in your life, somebody uh, looking at you as an individual, making an individual plan for you and then supporting you in a positive yes we can environment is going to be so much more successful than any of the negativities. So I think it's wonderful. I think it's really important that for those particularly working um, 
as support workers in this field, there's a lot to learn about autism and it can feel very, very overwhelming in actual fact, if you like Ramona and spend mm. how many years? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so I think there's so much to learn, but I think it, when positive support is a framework that I think gives some people some really clear ways to understand it and to be successful in the early days. Fantastic. And Elisa, in terms of, I know you've got a great support worker, what other kind of professionals are you engaging with, with your son? Um, is it speech pathologists? Is, it, is there any other professionals that you guys work with on a regular basis? Yeah, we do. Um, we were having a lot of difficulty getting out of the house um, up until kind of middle of last year or early last year. So we started um, using an OT and we kind of got out of the house to the basketball court and a few other places and that really kind of reopened up a lot of our life so that was very helpful um, we've used psych for a number of years um, both to support us as parents and also um, directly for our son he works with our psych on a fortnightly basis um, that's been really really effective um, he communicates really well with her it's it's been really positive um, and this year um, we focused on speech because obviously that's been pretty massive in our world to lose a whole component of communication. So we've been focusing on speech and the introduction of the um, text to speech um, and using an iPad has been phenomenal. So. And I would assume that, that your support workers would be involved in those kind of relationships as, as well, right? Um, yeah, to a degree, yeah. some of them are. So what I often do is, um, especially with Matt, who's who really performs a lot of that buddy peer role um, and can be quite influential. Um, so what I'll do is I'll make sure that, because we do a lot of our, all, in fact, we do all our therapy at home. Yeah. Um, I'm not a big fan of, of having to drive somewhere and, and sit in a room that's really um, different to our home life space. So all our therapy is done at home. Um, so I'll quite often try and combine a time to say, hey, Matt, just come in earlier or come so you can spend 15 minutes, half an hour with the therapist and just see what we're doing just to help support things, just to help give him some ideas as well. Because um, I think the better supported he is, um, you know, the, the more impact it has uh, on our family life. Absolutely. Mm. Well, that, that kind of does wrap up that behaviour conversation as well. Um, and I guess it kind of does wrap up the, the kind of conversation um, uh, that we are having tonight in providing insights into autism. But I do want to, you know, leave you with one big kind of statement that you kind of make. And you can take as much time as you want to answer this. But what we've got support workers, we've got parents, we've got people seeking support. We've got people who are just generally really interested in learning a lot more about autism and behaviour tuning in tonight. What, you know, what's one statement or tip you want to leave with them um, and Chairman, I might start with you first, if that's okay. Uh, one, one thing I want to leave behind is like, like, even if you have autism, it's like not the end of the world. It's, it's not really that bad. Like, it's got its challenges, but like, it's, it's just not as bad as you make out to be. Like, don't lose hope and never give up and you're like never alone in the, in the world. Yeah. And do you want to share a little bit more about, I know you're doing some great work at Jigsaw, but what do you want to be doing in the future yourself? Uh, I kind of want to be a digital artist working for a game development company. I, I studied at uh, TAFE before and I, when I passed, I got my diploma. Awesome. Yeah. Um, but yeah, mainly that. That's Fantastic. Awesome. Well, it's been so great having you on this panel tonight and we really appreciate you giving up your time to provide your insights into autism. Uh, Nicole, I might get your insights. Oh, uh, you, know. you can take it. You just, you know, uh, you've already told everyone that we're going to go away over 30 minutes, so it's all good. Well, I, you know, I, I think probably there's a couple of things. I, I, I would hate for anybody to hear the word autism and, and feel negative. Chen's right. Mm. It, there's nothing negative here. Um, the autism word, it's just a word. It's just the A word. Don't even say it if you don't want to say it, right? Don't ever think the autism part of it. Um, we're talking about an individual. But I think for both individuals with autism who might be having challenges or for parents or even parents of very younger children, um, the one thing I wish I had known at the start of all of this was that um, it just keeps getting better. It keeps getting enormously better. Mm. And the more you attend to love, support, and, and never give up on an individual with autism and your family unit... Um, you're the end user of your family, so the effort is all worth it. So never give up. Awesome. Thank you for that. Elisa? Um, yeah, for me, I think um, because tonight we've been talking about challenging behaviours and um, 
you know, sometimes I, I know in the early days we put lots of things in place so that um, when my son had had a meltdown, he had strategies and things to help him calm and, and kind of recover. Mm. Um, but I found there were quite a few years there that we were very isolated mm. and um, just because of all the things going on. And we'd get through a meltdown and I would feel absolutely shattered. And it was really draining and really hard. And so um, somewhere along that journey, I just thought, oh, I can't trust my emotions after, after an incident or a meltdown's happened because I'm shattered. And it would take me a while to kind of get back out of that slump. Mm. And so I guess my big one tip would be that as a parent, it's so important that we do put some things in place that help us. And I know it's easy to say that. And I've sat there on the other side and laughed and gone, yeah, right not easy but even really practically i just for me i would just write i wrote a um, post meltdown plan yeah and i wrote it into my phone because my brain was frazzled by mm -hmm. the end of some you know some of those moments and um and i'd just get it out and go okay what am i doing i'm all right he's safe he's calming down he's got his these things to do what am i going to do and so mine just had four simple things which was just let a friend know um that we've, you know, we've, we've had a meltdown, it's been challenging. Um, I'd play some certain music that for me was really kind of calming and just getting myself back together. Um, I'd have a drink of water, like literally it says it on my plan because you forget these things mm. when you're stressed, right? Um, and then the last one was then just go and have a rest. Kind of give yourself permission just to mm. go and have a rest. So, um, you know, it's a journey. Um, and we have to kind of go the long journey and it's a good journey. There's lots of great moments, but for those moments that are a bit tough and you need to kind of recover, for me, that would be my, my yeah. one tip. So, and I guess you're advocating for parents to engage in self-care wherever they can. Yeah. Um, in, 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 in saying that, um, I'd love to know what, uh, what, what playlist do you listen to uh, when, when, you are, <laughs> when you are trying to relax and unwind? Oh, I'm sure that our community of parents would love to. I Is it know, on Spotify? I knew you were going to ask me that. Um, I listen to kind of like some instrumental music, okay. so it's pretty pretty out there. But yeah, cool. I'm going to get that off you because what I'm going to do is when I'm going to follow up with all of our registrants with this video, I'm going to I'm going to share one song <laughs> that Lisa has recommended for us. I might get a song from each of you. Um, and, and Ramona, I think for me, it's one of the statements. I'm going to steal one of your statements, Tim. Um, it's really about difference so autism is not less it's different so i yeah. think it's again what am i doing to actually understand that a little bit more yeah. and if we're looking at behavior let's try and find the one positive behavior the strength yeah. that this person actually has and let's build from there and yeah. i think for all the support workers out there they're the people i think that they're there day in day out um and they actually see these strengths because they work with people every day so yeah. i think that's what i would like to finish up with awesome well thank you um i guess in wrapping up um it's there's so much more that we could be discussing tonight that we've only had a limited amount of time and i really want to encourage anyone who feels that we haven't answered a question uh whether it be not not as well as you would have liked it to be is as much detail um please let us know um uh, private messages on Facebook or send us an email at hello at, uh, hello at .com .au. we'd love to hear from you um and in saying that, we've tried to have this conversation at a large scale and we're probably not going to do it perfectly the first time, but we want to do it and we really think it's an important conversation to have. Um, so I really want to reiterate, thank you so much to every one of our registrants who've taken part tonight. Um, excitingly, we are working on some really big projects behind the scenes that are going to delve into these great topics we've talked about in much more detail. They are quite big projects, so they might not be ready for just a little while, but we will give you updates along the way. Um, and also want to say, uh, we are going to be having another high up session in September. So high up session three. I'm not going to give away too many details now, but high up sessions are going to be a monthly uh, feature for the high up team. Um, we're really excited to invite new guests in each month to discuss amazing topics. Uh, and just wrapping up, um, anyone who registered online or anyone who, who who wants a recording of this webinar, please feel free to reach out to us. Uh, we'll get one sent to you in the coming weeks. It'll be live captioned. Um, and if you do have any other questions or feel like we can improve in any way. If you have any feedback, we love feedback. Please give us feedback. Um, let us know. Otherwise, have a great night and we'll catch you soon.